Have you ever sat straight up in bed <laughs> at night and just said, what if, what if Jesus really didn't rise from the dead? Hey, what if? Uh, or you've asked God for forgiveness, but, but what if he hasn't forgiven me because I don't feel forgiven, so I, I'm not sure if I am. Or you've prayed about something important to you and you feel like nobody's home in heaven. Maybe you've asked the question, am I really a Christian? Am I sincere enough when I prayed that prayer? Well, we're going to talk about doubt today here in week three of our Hope in a House of Blues series. Because for people who are hungry for God, and the fact that you're in, in church at all today, regardless of what you would say your faith is, means you're hungry for God in your life. And for people who are attracted to following Jesus, uh, doubt is a form of blues in the key of D. That we're talking about this year. And somebody said, you can divide the world into three kinds of people. Those who can count and those who can't. Uh, I would be in the latter category, but for real, you can divide the world into three categories of people, three kinds of people. People who have doubts now, those who will have doubts in the future, and those who are no longer with us. <laughs> right? We're, we're all that kind of person. Sooner or later, you're going to have unanswered questions about things there will be issues that come up in your life, answers you won't know, and then you may move toward having a doubt about the character of God, or if God even cares, or even further, is there really a God out there who's listening? And so the question today for us is not, I wonder if I'll ever have doubts. The question is, what will I do with my doubts as a human being living in a fallen world full of blues? And the question is, not will I have doubts, but what will I do with them? Will it wreck my faith or will it actually lead to growth in my relationship with God and following Jesus? So first, I want to give a little perspective on doubt. We think, you know, I have doubts a lot. I wonder if I'm a Christian. Maybe I'm not or, or I'm like a really bad one. Well, let me put this in perspective. Doubt is not unbelief. I want you to hear this first and foremost today. Doubt is not the opposite of faith. Doubt is a form of faith. Doubt is a form of taking on the word Israel for God's people. Israel, in the Bible, that word means he or she who struggles with God. Doubt is a form of faith. It's a struggling with God. Now, the opposite of faith isn't doubt. The opposite of faith is unbelief. Unbelief is a willful refusal to believe even when you know what the truth is. And you go, no, I'm not going to believe that. Right? A conscious decision not to believe. But, but doubt is not unbelief. I looked up doubt in the dictionary. It's defined as this, to be uncertain about or a wavering of belief. It doesn't mean that you're not a believer in Christ. Now, I'll be honest with you. I'm a, I'm a pastor, which I know makes me very close to God, right? No. Actually, it just makes me just another guy who's one beggar trying to point a few more beggars where to find bread, the bread of life in Jesus. But as a pastor, uh, the other day somebody asked me, um, what do you believe about this uh, particular theological issue? And I was embarrassed because I had to say, I don't know. And here's what I meant by I don't know. Um, I know what the answers are supposed to be. I know every denominational position and every biblical argument about it, but I don't know in the end. I have some doubts about some things, friends. Uh, here's, my, here's a stack of some of the books. I've got a doubt shelf in my office. It's for me and those who I spend time with like you. Um, I've got my books on my scientific doubts right here. I've got my books on philosophical doubts right here. And I've got my doubts that are specific to the Bible right here. I'd love to read a book with you sometime and talk it over like I'm doing with a few friends right now here at Lake Forest. Um, I have some doubts about some things. I have a lot of questions. I have more questions than doubts myself. But I know that I'm still 100% a child of the living God, forgiven by Jesus Christ, because I have put my trust in him. I know him. But I still struggle with doubts. And I want to let you in on a couple of secrets. And, and, and I want to I see if, if like me, um, maybe you share doubt of biblical proportions. Let me show you a doubt of biblical proportions. Um, the first person is King David of Israel. The Bible describes him as a man after God's own heart. And he wrote most of the book uh, of the Psalms and the book of Psalms. But if you read the Old Testament, I don't know anyone who struggled with doubt 
more often and more frequently than King David of Israel. And it wasn't just a one-time thing early on in his life when he was 21 and he discovered beer and girls at college, right? It was his whole life. And every time he had doubt, he would go to the Lord and he would work it out in prayer and in poetry, what we know as the Psalms. I mean, this guy had an issue with everything if you read through the Psalms, okay? I think he was a melancholy sort of a guy. And usually by the end of a Psalm, he would, he would put it in perspective and, and see a glimpse of the Lord again. Psalm 73 is one of my favorite doubt psalms. And if you're wrestling with doubt, it might be the psalm for you to pray daily this week if you're going to spend some time in God's word. Um, Psalm 73, here it is. In fact, let's stand and read the word of God together for a moment. Verses 2 and 3. Would you guys stand? He says this, uh, all together. But I had nearly lost confidence. My faith was almost gone because I was jealous of the proud when I saw that things go well for the wicked. Let's read the first two sentences again. But I had nearly lost confidence. My faith was almost gone. Would you just kind of close your eyes for a moment? God, we've, David wrote this as a prayer, and we pray it along with him. It's here for us to pray. God, some of us here have nearly lost confidence in you. Some of us here, our faith is almost gone. And for you, na name Maybe a moment in time in your past when you've been at this place in your faith or where you are today and why. Just name it to the Lord for a moment. Lord, thanks that you acknowledge our doubts and you invite us to sing them to you like King David. Amen. You can be seated. So I'll read it one more time. But I had nearly lost confidence my Faith was almost gone because, and now here's his main reason for doubt, and it's different for everybody. Here was his main reason that year. Read the Psalms and you'll see he was always doubting about something. But that year, he says, because I was jealous of the proud when I saw the things go well for the New England Patriots, right? <laughs> uh, I mean, that, that's, his old, that, that's my main doubt in life. How can that be with a good God? Uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers, too. So David's like, here I am busting my behind can I keep going now here I am busting my behind doing the best I can to follow you Lord and, and I see a guy who's just as evil as the day is long Tom Brady and he's prospering <laughs> and he's flaunting it and God why and he's like I almost lost my faith over it what's the use do you see what I mean this is doubt of biblical proportion can anybody relate maybe Lake Forest it is doubt of biblical proportion. But he goes on and he deals with it. I'm going to let you go home and take it farther. And if it, it, when you struggle with doubt, Psalm 73 is the psalm that I turn to. And the, where he gets to is a solution. I'm not going to ruin it for you. But it's a really interesting place. It's profound. Strong faith is expressed by talking to God about the issues you have, the doubts you have. That's why we're singing our blues in this series. Church sisters, that's why we ask you to come and just sing them out a little bit because that's a biblical thing to do, just like King David did. And he becomes stronger in his faith as he prays them out. Doubt is not unbelief, nor is it unforgivable. Okay, how about a little bit more doubt of biblical? Maybe, maybe David is really unusual among people who know God or are seeking God, and, and, but, but really it's abnormal to have doubts. Well, let's look at another hero from the New Testament and see if he has doubt of biblical proportions. John the Baptist in the New Testament. You remember him? He was this crazy, freaky prophet who lived in the desert. He didn't bathe much. He ate only bugs and vegetables. And, uh, and he wore, just to show how serious he was about God and loving God and not the things of this world, he wore animal skins inside out so they scratched him all day long. And he was Jesus' cousin, okay? And he comes to a point as they're both adults, if he understands who Jesus is, he understands, oh my gosh, my co cousin Jesus, that obnoxious little snotty-nosed kid I remember, he is the Messiah, the son of the living God, the savior of the world. Oh my gosh, here it is in John chapter 1, verse 29. He says, uh, he says this, uh, let's put that up on screen. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God, that's a technical phrase in the Old Testament for the Messiah, the Savior, who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist, I mean, that's great faith, isn't it, friends? 
And, and, and the reason he had great faith is God had told him somehow in a vision or a dream, hey, you're John the baptizer, and one day somebody's going to come to be baptized by you. And when you baptize him, the sky's going to open up, the Holy Spirit's going to come down like a dove, and you're going to hear my voice of the Heavenly Father saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And that actually happened when John baptized Jesus. I think I'd have pretty strong faith if that happened to me. How about you? And John the Baptist did. He had a really firm faith. He had peace. And and maybe you have had events in your past, experiences, quiet moments, in which you were certain you had witnessed the living God breaking through into your life in some way. Maybe it was even through a miracle. Maybe it was that, that, like, you're hesitant to talk about because people will think you're a freak, you know? Maybe it was through a sense of peace that you had. God assured you of his presence and, and that, that his son is living. Maybe it was through answered prayer. I don't know. And at that moment, you were as certain as John the Baptist. You are the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Okay, that's John the Baptist. Let's fast forward in his life a little bit. This is some years later, okay? Now... John the Baptist gets arrested, he gets thrown in jail, and things aren't working out so good. He's like, man, the desert was awesome compared to being in this jail, and I'm under a death sentence. And he begins to doubt due to his circumstances. And he asks himself, is Jesus really the guy, the Messiah? So he sends two of his followers to go find Jesus and ask him this. Look at Matthew 11, verses 2 through 5. It says, when John was in prison, this is later, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one, or should we expect somebody else? Now, notice Jesus' reaction. Jesus doesn't react and go, what an idiot, man. I thought we had that straight. You knew I was the Messiah a long time ago. Get thee behind me, backslider, right? How does he respond? Look at this. No, no, no. He says, uh, He patiently tells John's disciples, go back and tell John something, what you've seen and heard. The blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life. Good news is being preached to the poor. Jesus recognizes John's got some doubts. And he says, okay, here's what I want you to do, guys. Go back and give him some evidence. And he gives him evidence that he is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies about the coming Savior or Messiah. That's what all those answers are, are answers, I'm the actual fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. So he gives him content-oriented. So Jesus takes John's question and doubt seriously and gives him content-oriented answers, not just, you know, you should just believe, you slimy lizard sinner. How dare you ask a question in my presence? And he goes, no. That's a good question. And there are answers to that. And he gives some answers. Jesus doesn't know. And this is really, now this is really even better. So after he gives the answer, Jesus still doesn't knock John and call him a backslider. Look at this. You're going to love this. And now he turns to the crowd. And in the middle of John's doubt, look what he says. I believe this is verse 11 of Matthew 11. Jesus says, truly I tell you, among those born of women, everybody, There has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. This is after John expressed unbelievable doubt, and he hasn't resolved it yet. Okay, this is like the next verse. It's not resolved yet. When you wrestle with questions, when you wrestle with doubt over current issues, God doesn't say, I'm moving you down into the weak Christian category or in the can't be a Christian category. You go to the back of the line. And I want you to lower your eyes and stutter when you call yourself a Christian, right? Right? And so, but I'm not a very good one. No, no, no. He says to John in the middle of his doubt, you're like the greatest of all people. And he says to you in the middle of your doubt the same thing your heavenly father says to you every day. You're my beloved daughter. You're my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Even in your doubts. Now, this doesn't mean because we see doubt of biblical proportions in the Bible and we experience it ourselves, it doesn't mean doubt is a holy, blessed thing that we should worship. And some people have slipped into that posture. If left unaddressed, doubt does great damage to faith over time. But God wants honesty in your relationship with God. So doubt is not unhealthy. It's not the unpardonable sin. Somebody said there's usually a grain of doubt in the oyster of your faith. And we know what an oyster does with a grain of sand. 
slowly turns it over and over into a pearl. And that's what can happen with doubt. It can be positive if we take steps to resolve it, right? Like when I was uh, uh, in college as a freshman at a state university, and I was studying uh, history, religion, and philosophy. And I remember hanging around some really smart guys on my freshman hall. They weren't Christians, but they came to this weekly Bible study in my room that me and my friend Bobby started, and we just looked at Jesus in the Gospel of John, which, by the way, is our next sermon series. Um, and they, were, they all came because they were my Nerf hoop buddies. The first day that I moved into my freshman dorm, I, I taped off a court, a full court Nerf place. And, uh, and man, we played so much Fi Slamma Jamma uh, that freshman year. And so they were my buddies, and they would come to this, this discussion about the Gospel of John. And they would ask me questions in ways that were just taking shots at my faith. Oh, yeah? Well, what about this, you know, about Jesus? And I go, well, you know, I, um, let me answer that. And they go, well, yeah, well, what about that, about Jesus? And I go, ah, man, that's a good question. I never thought of that one. I don't know. Let me go work on that, right? I'll get back to you. And it would spring a little bit of doubt in my mind. What if they're right? What if that pokes a hole in Jesus? You can't poke a hole in Jesus. In Christianity, right? Uh, and what I would do is I would go research. And that grew my faith stronger. That was my major faith solidifying year, in fact. Uh, when I entertain more doubt than ever, but I, fought, I pursued the questions more than ever as well. Gary Parker says this in his book, The Gift of Doubt. He says, if faith never encounters doubt, if truth never struggles with error, if good never battles with evil, how can faith know its own power? Furthermore, he goes on to say this, if I had to choose between faith that has stared doubt in the eye and made it blink, or a naive faith that's never known the firing line of doubt, I would choose the former every time. I want a faith that has stared doubt in the eye and made it blink because that is a faith worth having to me. And that's what I want for you, the tribe of Lake Forest here. So doubt, though, is still a dangerous thing that can erode your faith if left unaddressed. So how do we deal with it, okay? We've acknowledged it here in worship through song and looking at John the Baptist and King David. But then what do we do with it? Well, uh, let me offer some thoughts. The first thing that I would say is to diagnose the root of your doubt. Find the source of it, okay? Uh, and here are some common sources. It, it, clarify the question that, that your doubt is around, that you're struggling with, and then trace it to the source. Sometimes the source of our doubt are our thoughts, in Proverbs 4, 23, God teaches us, be careful what you think because your thoughts run your life. And this is why we should examine our doubts. We should examine our faith, and then when you have doubts, you should really examine your doubts because if they're not examined, they're gonna run your life if they just keep running and running and you haven't looked into replace them with truth. Um, so our thoughts can run our life and our thoughts can ruin our life if we think untrue thoughts over and over. Um, I know people in our partner ministries in Bolivia and in India who have nearly nothing to their name. They don't own anything, but they have a great life because of their thoughts about their life and of who they are in Christ. Our thoughts can give access to doubt, right? Do you ever read the Bible and then put it down and the thought comes to you, do I really believe there are angels and demons, right? Do I really believe like there, there's a heaven and a hell? Well, especially if we don't know what we believe, know in our mind and our thoughts, then our thoughts can feed doubt. And so one of the ways that we, that we um, diagnose and arm ourselves and inoculate ourselves against doubt is to be believers who, who learn our faith and know what we believe over time. You know, maybe you had a professor at school, or you do right now, and they're a real intellect, and you're intimidated by their mind, and they say to you, you don't really believe the Bible, do you, right? I mean, that's stuff. How do you know it's true? And maybe you begin to have some doubt. Doubt that comes from our thoughts begins when we don't know why we believe what we believe. And that's why I researched so much in college when I doubted, why do I believe this? You know, maybe you say, I know God loves me. He loves me a lot. And, and by the way, we teach that here, that there's nothing you can do to make God love you more or less than he does right now. His love is unconditional. It's immense. And it, it is the, at the core of his nature, Jesus taught us. And we teach God's love a lot here. That's why we run out of room in here. That's why we run out of room in the parking lot. And why we're, we're starting new churches and making more room here. Because people need to hear about God's love for them 
through Jesus Christ. But if you know God's love and mercy through Jesus, but if they're the only two aspects of God's character that you've gotten to know as a Christian, and you've been a Christian a long time, and then you come face to face with God's holiness or God's justice or God's judgment, you'll be confused but, and you'll doubt because the Bible teaches that not only is God loving, but God is also just and God is holy, right? And I know many people who get stuck here in their doubt. They, just, they, they only got to know God's love and mercy and they don't want to know the rest of God's character revealed in the scriptures. So when we don't take time to understand God's holiness, sometimes it causes us to doubt. Or we doubt in our mind if we think God's promised us something that he hasn't. You know, maybe you went to some weird meeting and they promised you wealth or something if you said the name of Jesus five different times in a certain direction, you know, and you're like, man, I'm, I'm not any wealthier or healthier. In fact, I'm, you know, <coughs> a little verklempt at the moment, right? Um, that could cause you to doubt if you, if you are believing something God hasn't promised. So, so our thoughts can be the center of our doubts. You got to trace the root to that. And if it's particularly, if it's intellectual, you need to clarify the question. I'm really proud of some of you at Lake Forest working on clarifying your questions right now. And, and there are a couple of folks that are, uh, we're reading a book together about their specific question because they've traced the root of their doubt and now they're looking into it. A second area that can cause doubt is our emotions. Some people, some of our faith subconsciously, we don't know this, is built on emotion. Maybe when we became a Christian or, or maybe every week when you sing and pray in church, you really feel God's presence, which is a good thing. But then when the feeling subsides, then we doubt our faith. And this is a misunderstanding of the relationship between faith and feeling because faith is based on a decision, not a feeling. It's a choice you make to say, I'm going to give my heart to Jesus Christ because I trust that he's who he says he is in the scriptures. Now, feelings come from that right? Uh, in fact, I hear that about you in worship sometimes. Some of you say, every time I come into worship, I, I find myself, you know, getting really emotional. And that's wonderful. That means you're opening up your true heart to the Spirit of God when you're with the people of God. But it's okay if you come in here and you don't feel a thing <laughs> because God's still in the midst of us. He's still true and he's still true to his word and he's still at work in your life because faith is not a feeling. Faith is a decision Faith doesn't come and go depending on how worked up and lathered and Jesus, 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 fired up you are. That's not faith. That's feeling. But sometimes we doubt because emotion waxes and wanes, right? Um, some people deal with emotional doubt because of past scars, maybe a family scar. Uh, maybe you were abused by a family member. Maybe it was spiritual abuse in a church that you grew up in or were a part of. Because church leaders and members are made up of imperfect people who are also just, just trying to grab a hold of the grace and love of Jesus. And so maybe you have a hard time opening yourself up to total abandonment to your heavenly father. Because emotionally you feel like, I wonder when God is going to let me down because everybody else sure has. And that may be an emotional root of your doubt. A third root of doubt can come through our will. It can enter into a Christian and also to those who, who you would go, I don't know if I'm a Christian, maybe I used to be, or I don't know, I'm not really sure. It can enter into us when we enter into a willful choice to continue in sinful behavior that we've learned is against God's will for our lives. Like you know that something, you're doing something you know is wrong, um, and it's a part of life that we've just compartmentalized from God and justified it, right? And we're willfully making a choice to live in it even as we're trying to seek God. And what happens is when sin is allowed to just stay in our life willfully, it disrupts the peace, the spiritual peace in our life that the Holy Spirit lives in our spirit to give us. Sort of jacks that up a little bit. Because Jesus said, my peace I leave with you. And so doubt comes in when we allow just, you know, pure sort of disobedience to God to make us feel distant from God, right? And so we're riding along and we're trying to pray and we're like, where's God, man? I don't know, feel him right now. Still, it feels like a barrier. Well, it's a barrier of our own will. God still loves you. And in that moment, no matter what it is, he's like, man, just, just run on back into my arms. Um, doubt can come if you've never made a conscious, volitional decision to put your trust in Jesus as the son of God, your savior, and the savior of the world. 
I've seen this a lot. Uh, folks will go, you know, I've been here a while, Mike, and, and I sort of was in church, and I kind of know some of the stuff, but I don't feel like I have a personal relationship with, with God through Jesus the way you talk about it, right? I know people who do, but it's, it's still not seeming real to me. Well, it might be because you don't yet have a personal relationship with him. Maybe you've never fully, personally given all of yourself to all of him. So doubt, you need to trace it to the root of, of mind, emotions, and will. Backtrack to it. It's helpful to diagnose how doubt got into your life before you can really deal with it. Um, you may be here today and you're dealing with some doubt and you've already been able to say, yep, what he just said, that's it. And that's why I'm dealing with it. Sometimes it's deeper than the surface, you know. I've known people over the years who had some questions uh, that were their real issue. They were seriously intellectually driven and they had questions and nobody had offered them good answers or made it safe to ask them. But I've also known other people whose questions weren't the real issue and they were uh, smoke sp screens. You ever break up with a boyfriend or girlfriend when you were a teenager and like use a smoke screen reason? Because you didn't want to just say, you know, man, I just don't dig you uh, anymore. I just don't like you. You know, who wants to say that? Um, hopefully none of you, um, right? And so you made up a smoke screen reason. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's your perfume or it's the way you twirl your hair. You made up some weak, lame reason, you know, and, and they kind of know the real one. Well, sometimes we have a smoke screen reason. We want to distance ourselves from God in our will, right? Um, because maybe we have too much pride to come before a holy, loving God and say, I give you everything. I bend the knee. You are God and not me. Um, and so sometimes for us, our, our question can be a smokescreen for bending the knee to our Heavenly Father. Um, so uh, the first thing is to track the source of your doubt. The second way to deal with it in a healthy way is to ask for God's help and to ask for God's people's help and to be really tenacious about this. Just be honest with God. Don't you love, if you may be familiar with it, the story of a father who came to Jesus and he had a question for Jesus, would you heal my son, right? It was like a, 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 a prayer request on steroids. And Jesus said, do you believe I can? And I don't know if you remember this man's answer. If he'd been a real religious guy, he would have pumped himself up and gone, oh yes, I believe, sure I do, even though he didn't believe. But he was honest. And in Mark uh, chapter 9, verse 24, he said, you know what? I, I do sort of believe, but I don't believe. Would you help my unbelief? He asked for Jesus' help in his doubt. And Jesus didn't blow him away. He looked at him. He loved his honesty, and he said, I'll do it for you. And he healed his son. So when you're struggling with questions, go to God. Ask him to help you believe. In James chapter 4, verse 2, God promises, it says this, you don't have because you don't ask. And so just ask him, God, lead me to people, lead me to books, lead me to places that I can go to put this doubt to rest and then go after it. We're not just going to teach this and then offer no, no ways to follow it through. Tomorrow night and the next night, we're having two sessions on doubt. If I could see that on screen, an open forum to express and explore doubt, a safe place to ask questions. It's not going to be some big, high emotional debate. A friend of mine who does this all the time lets people explore their doubt and offers uh, his perspective. Chip Cash will be here. It's tomorrow night at 7 o'clock here and, uh, and then also the following Monday as well. You don't have to register. You just show up. Um, so ask God and God's people for help. This would be a way of asking both. You know, go to your community group, your men's or women's group. This is the reason smaller groups are so important here at Lake Forest. It's for this to be a safe place to be who you are, express your questions, and just go, hey, I know all you other people here in my community group. You got all this down tight, but I have a doubt on this issue. And your group's not going to blow you away. If they do, tell me, and I'll get them, okay? Uh, <laughs> Because there have been times in my life I've had to grab onto the shirt tail of other people's faith. And maybe you do too. And Lake Forest, if you're in a group, a men's or a women's group or a, a community group, and somebody is brave enough to share a doubt or a question, first of all, don't freak out. Second of all, don't like be like, oh, oh my gosh, we better spend the whole rest of the time. Hey, who's got an answer? We got, oh my God. Blah, blah. Just be like, hey, has anybody else ever wrestled with that question? You got any thoughts? And then feel free to move on in the agenda. And just let it be a safe place. See, most people I know are not looking for a religion that answers all of their questions. 
Most people are more humble than that and realize any God worth serving is a God bigger than me and my brain and my little teeny tiny uh, ability to figure him out. So most people aren't looking for every question to be answered. They're looking for a community of faith in which they feel safe to ask their questions. Could we create that kind of a community here at Lake Forest? I pray so. The third way to deal with our doubt is to continue or begin to implement faith-building habits to help you deal with doubt, okay? you like a doctor. You go to a doctor and you're sick. They prescribe some stuff to deal with your illness right now. Like, so go, go work on answers to that question. But they also prescribe um, habits for ongoing health so you don't get sick again. And so in the midst of doubt, we got to feed and exercise our faith with good habits so that we'll work through our current doubt, and then the next time doubt comes, we'll be in a healthier place with our faith. And the two healthiest habits that, that, that I know are the daily habit of reading God's Word, the Scriptures. Just go get a Bible in a modern translation, get a devotional that, uh, like at the Christian bookstore, there's a Lifeway store now at North Lake Mall that just has a little bit of scripture a day and then explains it so you don't have to know everything. Um, And another habit is to hang out with people of faith, which we just addressed. The fourth thing to do with your doubt is expect some unresolved tension. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says this, we see and understand only a little about God now as if we're peering at his reflection in a poorly lit mirror. Someday we'll see God perfectly clearly, but, but right now we don't have a clue on a lot of things, and we won't have a full answer on many questions until heaven will just have to wait. And so sometimes as you grow in your faith, you'll get an answer to something that you've wrestled with for a long time, and sometimes you won't. And in the meantime, it's okay, because the last thing that we do in the face of our doubt is we focus on what you know to be true, in particular, Jesus Focus your faith on Jesus, friends, on what you know to be true, that you found him to be the literally resurrected son of God, the one who says, follow me, my way of life is the best way to live in this life, and follow me into eternity in the kingdom of heaven, the new heavens and the new earth. So the Bible says, keep your thoughts on what's true and honorable and right, that there's a God that the Bible's true, that Jesus is God and he proved it with the resurrection, that there's a heaven and a hell and that following Jesus in this life is the best way to live and we don't have to know everything to know something. Do you know that in your job and everything? You don't have to know everything to know something. We know what we need to know and we may have to be patient about the other stuff. Let's pray as we prepare to close in worship. Heavenly Father, um, we thank you for the example of biblical doubt. We just thank you that you welcome us like King David to sing and shout and pray our doubt to you. And God, we ask that your spirit would help our spirits be absolutely sure about one thing today. God, could we leave here having no doubt about where we stand with you? And friends, I ask you this morning, do you know where you stand with God? It's the most important question you can ask yourself. Have you trusted your entire life to Jesus Christ? And if you haven't, you can do it right now. Uh, I'm gonna pray in a moment and you can pray it with me knowing that if we trust him, we are adopted as a child of God once for all time. And so Father, we thank you for your word that it's true and it's good. And Lord, there's some of us here who've been on the fence. We've been on the edge of the pool dipping our toe in. And today we're ready to take the plunge of faith And God, we don't understand everything there is to know about you or even ourselves, but we know enough that Jesus is who he said he is, and he proved it with the resurrection. So today, Jesus, we take the plunge and we say yes to you. I want to follow you. I'm making a decision of my will to receive you as my Savior and ask for forgiveness of my sins. And God, would you seal us with certainty in your Holy Spirit? And God, others of us, where we've been making willful choices to walk away from you in an area of our life, we give that to you today. And Lord, for Christians here who've been feeling distance from you because of doubt and have been beating themselves up over it, Lord, we understand today that it's okay, that you care about us, and you'll make those doubts into something good. We now bring them to you over the coming weeks. 
And we ask that you would thus make our faith stronger. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.